Hi, I figured I'd make a video today to talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about lately in reading. And today's mostly going to be looking at some facsimiles that I've been reading lately of books from generally around like 1600 or so, give or take some years. And um, yeah, the first one right here is an edition of the King James Bible from 1611. It probably says it on the end here, yeah. And um, it's the one that was done for the 400th anniversary a few years ago. Oxford University Press put it out. And um, yeah, as you can see here, uh, it's not in the actual uh, uh, typography that it was in because that was in black letter which if you have if you don't know what black letter is it's quite difficult to read even if you um, take your time but yeah you can see it has like all the old spelling and all the old uh, like the V is a U and things like that and the interesting thing is I didn't know this about this so it talks about the translators but then it also gives calendars January hath 31 days and all this stuff and uh, then it also has genealogies and quite a lot of genealogies and then here is the first book of Moses And God said, that, let there be light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. So yeah, it's just really enjoyable to read in this old edition because you can really imagine what sort of accomplishment it was to have such a translation and that even though it's a translation from the original, and you could say the more original, Greek and Latin that uh, it still was such a big influence and that's one thing I've thought recently like um, how short-sighted it is for English degrees to only be reading stuff that has originally been written in English because I mean of all things the King James Version of the Bible is a translation and yet it was such a big influence on English literature. So, you know, why can't other translated works be uh, in English literature class, like, you know, Dostoevsky or something, or just any, anything you can imagine, you know, R Rousseau or whatever it happens to be, Goethe. Because, you know, you look at Homer and stuff and like Chapman's translations and yeah, I just think it's really short-sighted to only look at books originally written in English, in English class. Even though some people may think that's silly. So that first one is what I've been looking at. It's uh, quite interesting. It has that gilt edge on it. But, uh, yeah, and then I think I've showed these before. My other, like, book on spelling and facsimiles. But this one has... Uh, the original on the right, how it's spelled and typography and stuff, and then um, modern translation basically on the left. And uh, the, mo the more I think about it, I think that it's such a shame that books are basically translated from the way they originally looked into a more modern dress or modern fashion. And um, it's because, first of all, you're not seeing it how it looked when it came out originally. So you're seeing something different. And it may be difficult to tell what the effect is because um, one thing I think about is, so let's imagine that when you're learning about Shakespeare, you see it in the original typography. You know, like, you read it like this. You know, you see the, the S, the long S. You see the different spelling. 
So you, you immediately understand intuitively, okay, this is something different. You know, I, I, have to, I have to learn it. I have to pay attention. You know, it's not something I can just, you know, read like a newspaper. But then when you see it like this, you think to yourself, oh, I see stuff like this all the time. This is obvious, you know, whatever. It's, oh, they took out the E in bettering, you know, that's, that's like the only, oh, and they say thou, you know, it's old. But I, I really do think there's a disservice where when you see it like this, at least when you're first introduced to it, you, you really see something new. You know, it, re it really strikes you as new. And unique and um, I think precious really. And also, at least for me, it's giving me a, much, a lot more enjoyment reading it like this than reading it in the like you know modern typeface because this is how someone of Shakespeare's time would have read it this is how they read it in history and it it uh, removes some of the barrier or some of the distance when you can read it exactly how they read it and it's really not difficult you just have to remember a couple letters so it's it's really trivial and I, I think it's an insult really to the intelligence of anyone reading it if you if they think oh you have to read it like this you know it's really pathetic it's hardly different as you can see here when you show both at the same time if you want to pause it and look at both it's hardly different it's really an insult to the intelligence of the reader that you think it has to be translated but yeah, this edition is the one, the Shakespeare Sonnets, edited by Booth, published by Yale, if you want the uh, sonnets in facsimile. And um, I also have, uh, you may remember, the first folio, the, which only includes the plays. But it's very good. You know, I, I enjoy reading it so much. I mean... It's, it's just so enjoyable to read in this compared to reading it in some, you know, modern translation with tons and shitloads of notes and just all this heinous stuff, really. It starts with The Tempest, which I think is interesting because that was his uh, last play he finished. But you now one thing about Shakespeare is like I was talking to one of my friends and, you know, he reminded me that Shakespeare is the best-selling fiction author of all time with an estimated 4 billion copies sold. And, uh, you know, what, what I would emphasize with that is that it's sold, not read or understood, you know. Because you could easily say that Shakespeare is the most, or the, or the least understood or the most misunderstood author of all time because, you know, people buy it and don't know anything. And I don't think it's necessarily their fault that they don't know anything because whenever you get these modernized editions like Alexander Pope tried to do, tried to correct Shakespeare, make his lines better, you know, Alexander Pope is a joke compared to the Elizabethans or some of the modernists or, you know, it's too, uh, I don't know, I don't need to get into that, but I'm just trying to focus on the the good stuff in this one, but yeah, it's like, you know, he tried to correct the lines or, oh, Shakespeare would never make a line like this. You know, I have to, I have to make it perfect meter. He wouldn't have made it messed up meter here. It's like, what, what an idiot, you know, what, what sort of idiot would make that mistake to try to correct something like that? You know, the, uh, the, the variations is partially what makes it good. And that, that's also with, um, you know, misspellings, you know. If they had misspelled a word in the typeface or the, when they printed it, that, that's, that's really enjoyable, you know, I think. And it's the same thing with the new editions of Ulysses where, you know, the Gabler edition that they, you know, change so much. But what they change is changing history. You know, they're, they're basically trying to change history because the edition published in 1922 was the one that changed literature, that made everyone understand what was going on. And I, I can only say that it's such a shame that people feel the need to change it, to try to change history like that. And uh, if I can make like a slight uh, 
divergence here from the main point of the video is that um, I have to take a lot of um, bullshit classes this semester. One on uh, adolescent literacy, one on individual differences, one on teaching high school, uh, teaching English to high school students. And um, in the adolescent literacy class, I have to read YA books so that I can get the mindset of someone, you know, who's a, an adolescent as if I was never an adolescent. But, you know, so I'm having significant trouble with my, like, dignity trying to read a YA book because they're all extremely terrible. And uh, I'm going to try to, even though I don't think The Catcher in the Rye is a good book at all, it's the least bad book that I can find on the list of the best YA books. I'm going to see if they'll let me read The Catcher in the Rye as a YA book. But, you know, you get the whole spiel on the beginning day about the canon, and it's all white males, and they all write about the same stuff, you know, as if that's correct, as if the people critiquing it have read anything, you know, apart from, you know, Shakespeare and, you know, fucking Jane Austen, which doesn't even fit with their, their thesis. But... You know, all, all this stuff on the canon, it's its basically a uh, straw man attack on something that basically doesn't even exist anyway. Because, um, so, you know, there is this idea of a canon, and like dingbats like Harold Bloom actually write it down, you know, as if it exists. But basically all they're doing is trying to save people time. So you don't waste time reading horrible shit because you're going to die. And that's, that's a nice thing to do. I think people underestimate how nice that is to do, to read a ton of stuff and actually tell people, hey, maybe you should avoid this stuff. You're going to waste your whole life reading horrible shit. You know, if you don't have the, the awareness or the taste or the intelligence to realize that some stuff is a waste of time. You know, maybe you'll read it for 10 years and then you'll realize, wow, that was some worthless stuff. I can't believe I wasted so much time reading it. They're saving you that trouble. Most people don't appreciate that. Maybe not most people, but a large amount of people. But then, you know, they, they, they say, these people, and I've heard it. I wouldn't believe it unless I'd heard it. They say that that the canon is all the same. All these Dead white European males is how they phrase it. Write about the same stuff. And I just, I cannot even imagine the stupidity in their, you know, their skulls. You know, that how much stupidity fits in their little lump of brain flesh. You know, it's like, how did they get so mistaken? Explain to me how someone from ancient Greece can have the same experience as literally any other literature in the whole canon, you know, if you, if you imagine a canon it exists. You know, explain to me how Virgil, living in, you know, near, thousand, near zero, the year zero, is anything similar to, you know, Homer or anything else that came after in where he's coming from. And, you know, the goal may be the same, but I mean, it's a completely different culture. Hundreds of years after Homer, you could say thousands of years before most other things people read. It's like, how can you be such an idiot to believe it's similar at all? You know, and to... To actually prove that it's similar, you'd have to have such a massive command of history. You'd have to have a completely expansive imagination to be able to imagine where these people were coming from, what they tried to do, what they did accomplish. You'd have to be able to read the original languages to see how they compare to each other, to actually give a, a significant critique. And of course, none of these people read anything. You know, my, my uh, teacher for my adolescent literacy class reads YA books for her own enjoyment because she said that they're more, she basically said, I can't remember the exact phrase she used, but they're, they're basically more 
open. They're, they're more emotionally open than uh, most adult literature. You know, of course she doesn't read. Because you can't find anything more emotionally open than Ulysses or Sutri or all the good modernists or Goethe or on and on, Walt Whitman. But, uh, you know, of course these people don't read and, um, you know, they think we need to start reading heinous shit just so we don't focus on dead white European males anymore, which is um, a horrible goal. You know, the only people that are discriminated against is uh, good writers. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, oh, I'll get off that point. But, uh, yeah, so this Shakespeare is really excellent. I recommend getting it if you uh, get a chance. And another one I've uh, found recently that I really have been enjoying immensely is I was able to find a facsimile of Milton's Paradise Lost from 1667. And um, you may know that that was the, the first edition, which was in 10 books instead of the 12. And I'll uh, let you look at it. This is from the Scholar Press, uh, it's, which is a really good press I found. It's from one copy, so there are some uh, possible mistakes because of that. But you see here of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us. And you see on the second page where you get some uh, good phrase about halfway through line 60 that steadfast hate at once as far as angels can he views the dismal situation waste and wild a dungeon horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flamed yet from those flames no light but rather darkness visible oh yeah and then a little bit higher there like line 55 or so it says uh, for now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay you know it's just such, such good stuff and, uh, yeah, and as you see on here, it, it looks, you know, it's actual pictures of uh, an edition from 1667. How beautiful is that? Paradise Loft. And, uh, like, <clears throat> I don't know, guys, tell me if you, you feel differently, but I just feel such connection to history when I read it in the original as they would have read it like it's it's a huge difference and I can imagine that it shouldn't be such a big difference to read it you know in a facsimile and you know it just lights your imagination off and as you see oh <laughs> look at this here this is such a good one they're spicy drugs whence merchants bring their spicy drugs <laughs> but yeah, this is the uh, edition, if you look for it, Scholar Press, Paradise Lost, 1667. It's a little pricey, but it's well worth it if you get the chance. And um, yeah, and then this is kind of like going to be another tangent here, but um, much more interesting one. So at the library, I was looking at the oversized book section, which is where they have like Bottom's Dream and the Shakespeare folios and, you know, complete works of Ben Jonson and the facsimile and everything. And I found this book, which I actually looked at, a, uh, you know, a, an actual edition from 1591, which is uh, Orlando Furioso, an English heroical verse translated by John Harrington, who was one of the guys who came up with a flush toilet. <laughs> and... You know, this is the cover page, Orlando Furioso in English. 
And if you're not familiar, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it after I show you this. But uh, yeah, Orlando Furioso was an Italian epic poem that came out. The first edition was like 1516 and came out in subsequent editions. And I think 1532 was the last edition right before the author died a year later, who was um, Ludovico Ariosto, an Italian. To give you an idea of the times, like... Um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci died in 1519, I'm pretty sure. Um, Michelangelo lived to... Michelangelo lived from 1474 to like 1564 or something, maybe the same year Shakespeare was born, I think. Something like that. Interesting. But, um, yeah, and this is, an, this is a facsimile as well from the... the uh, 1591. And an interesting thing is I was in a Spencer class, which unfortunately I had to drop last semester because of the, the fire and my multiple hospital stays. But one thing I was able to do in that class is uh, we went to our rare book library, the Harry Ransom Center, which is an excellent one if you don't know about it. And we looked at an actual first edition from 1591 of this book. And it looked exactly like this, you know, it's, it's a facsimile of the actual stuff. Of dames, of knights, of arms, of love's delight, of courtesies, of high attempts, I speak. Then when the Moors transported all their might on Africa seas, the force of France to break, drawn by the youthful heat and raging spite of Agramant, their king, that vowed to wreak the death of King Triane lately slain, upon the Roman Emperor Charlemagne. You know, and it's just, um, the, the illustrations here are just, you know, really cool too. And, uh, you know, this is a good translation. I mean, I don't know as far as the, I don't know what fidelity for the Italian, but it's very enjoyable to read. It reminds you a lot of, you know, let's say the King James or the Chapman's Homer because it came from around that same time. And uh, unfortunately, this one is also expensive to purchase, this facsimile, but if you get a chance, it's awesome. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, like, this time period, basically, the, you know, the Italian Renaissance, because I've been pretty interested in it lately. It's the odd thing that, you know, the Italian Renaissance was such a big influence in our culture, but basically no one knows anything about it. You know, everyone knows uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa and, oh, he drew a tank. And uh, people know a little bit about, you know, Machiavelli and the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But basically no one knows anything about it. You know, you don't really know much by, you know, looking at the Mona Lisa painting. Unless you look at it really closely, which, you know, nobody does. They look at it, you know, 40 people back in the Louvre, but... Um, I've been tr getting into this lately, trying to become acquainted with this time period of literature, and uh, this is the Oxford World Classics of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, and when I asked that teacher I had for Spencer what edition I should read, she recommended this, which is a prose translation by Guido Waldman, and uh, this is okay. I mean, it's just more... Uh, transactional, like you, you look at it and you get the information. But apart from that, that, that's really all you get, which is okay. You know, it's not too bad. But the addition I like, apart from the facsimile of the first translation, which is the best, is uh, this one here. This is a translation by um, Barbara Reynolds. Yeah. And she taught uh, Italian at uh, Cambridge University. And um, part of the reason why this is so good is, as you see on this uh, contents page, it has over a hundred page introduction. And I read it, and it's very enlightening. As you can see from the uh, little uh, titles here. Orlando Furioso in English Literature, the translation of its predecessors, 
And then if you, once you start reading the book, because it's such a big book, you have all the uh, notes here. And then, not to give you an idea how it's different here, you can read some of the translation. So it's clearly in modern English. But uh, it's really enjoyable. And then another book that I haven't read yet, I just found at the library recently, is actually an older version of this uh, Orlando trajectory. Because if you're not familiar, it starts with the Song of Roland, which is like around 1100 A AD, I believe, um, medieval French. It's about uh, Charlemagne um, going into... Uh, well, basically the Muslims invaded part of Europe and Charlemagne fought them back. And a guy called uh, Roland was one of his generals and it's about him. And then there's a, uh, became like a long tradition, kind of like King Arthur, where people wrote stuff and changed, added new characters, took away characters, made people married who hadn't been married and made people relatives who hadn't been relatives. And uh, Il Morgante is actually from the late 1400s. And it was written around the same time as um, Orlando Enamorato, which is the first part, basically, by a guy named Boyardo. And he died before he finished writing that, Orlando Enamorato. And Orlando Furioso is the continuation of that poem because uh, Orlando in Love is the translation and then uh, Mad Orlando, which is like uh, once he got in love, he lost his mind uh, from being in love. And uh, this Il Morgante is uh, about Orlando also and he gets he converts a giant from Muslim to Christianity, and then they go on a whole bunch of uh, really ridiculous adventures, and uh, Benedetto Croce said this was the most genial book in Italian literature, like it's just good, uh, good hearted, I guess, is what he meant to say, you know, and uh, anyway, yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that, because you may not have heard of it, and um, it's pretty neat, unfortunately it's expensive, but... And then uh, and one other book I wanted to show you that I found recently and been enjoying is this book here called Teofilo Folengo. I mean, that's the author's name. It's called Baldo. This is part of the uh, Itati Renaissance Library, published by uh, Harvard, one of the Harvard Press. And this book is... Uh, one of the origins of macaronic literature. If you're familiar with Finnegan's Wake, Finnegan's Wake is a macaronic work. Uh, in the original uh, Italian Renaissance meaning of the term, it meant they used Latin and Italian dialects in the same work. Um, and this book does that. It's where, because as you see here, it gives the original, you know, Italian and uh, Latin, and then it gives a English translation on the right side. And he was known for being really playful with his language and, you know, using the Italian for low subjects and using the Italian dialect for, I, I say Latin for the low things, and then the Italian dialect for high things, and, uh, you know, that, it, that makes it more funny because it's unexpected in that way. And uh, this was a big influence on Rabelais because this came out in 1517, which is, you know, two years before uh, Da Vinci died and Michelangelo still, you know, creating stuff. And uh, yeah, 1517 was pretty early on. Rabelais comes a little bit later, I think 20 years later, something like that. And yeah, this book is uh, really funny. And I've been really kind of focusing on that sort of macaronic tradition, which is why I've been reading this, because of, uh, you know, Bottom's Dream and Finnegan's Wake and Midsummer Night's Babel and 
you know, all these sort of books that play with language. Um, the Devil to Pay in the Backlands is the English translation by uh, Joao Guimarães Rosa, that one too. Yeah, I've, I've really been interested in this sort of tradition of uh, multi-language literature. But uh, yeah, look into that one if you're interested in it. And then before I show you one more thing, I want to read you a section from uh, this Conversations of Goethe with Peter Eckermann. And because uh, I just found this recently, if you can believe it, I never read it before, even though I like Goethe so much. But it's so funny because, um, yeah, so this section here, Goethe's reading Manzoni, you know, the, the betrothed, I think is uh, how they translate it. And it says, you will hardly understand, said Goethe, how a poet like Manzoni, capable of such admirable compositions, could even for a moment sin against poetry. Yet the cause is simple. It is this. Manzoni, like Schiller, was a born poet, but our times are so bad that the poet can find no nature fit for his use in the human life that surrounds him. To build himself up, Schiller seized on two great subjects, philosophy and history, Manzoni on history alone. Schiller's Wallenstein is so great that there is nothing like it of the same sort. Yet you will find that even these two powerful helpers, history and philosophy, have injured parts of the work and hinder a purely poetical success. So Manzoni suffers from too great a load of history. Your, excell your Excellency, said I, speaks great things, and I am happy in hearing you. Manzoni, said Goethe, helps us to good thoughts. And uh, I thought about this because I think about, you know, Ulysses, that it's, you know, this encyclopedic work. And I do wonder what detriment that has on the book. Something like Bottom's Dream, you know, or Finnegan's Wake. Because, of course, you know, you could say Joyce was a born poet, but... There are some detriments to it. And I wonder, you know, what state we're in in our current time, which, you know, basically uh, we're advancing at such a rate that history is getting harder and harder to bridge because that's really the goal of a excellent artist is to connect their current time with all of human history. And people have been able to do that at least until, you know, Cormac McCarthy or William Gaddis and... I worry that it's getting, you know, uh, almost impossibly difficult to do. And uh, the last one I want to show you here is kind of a little uh, <laughs> special thing that's not strictly related to literature, but it's a uh, facsimile of a book from 1634, uh, Ambrose Paré, the collected works of Ambrose Paré who was a 